Hello, and welcome everyone to day two of I Dream in Widescreen. I'm still your host, and I'm still Jeff Yance, Program Director at the Loft Cinema here in Tucson. I'm also still a proud alum of the University of Arizona School of Theater, Film, and Television. Now, following the activities of day one, I hope you've gotten plenty of rest and devoured an energy bar because the I Dream in Widescreen excitement continues today unabated as we present three conversations with film and television luminaries, all of them U of A alumni, before we present the world premieres of seven more films made by graduating seniors of the school's class of 2020. And of course, everything culminates as it must with a thrilling awards ceremony later this evening. Now you can keep your Oscars, you can keep your Golden Globes, you can even keep your People's Choice Awards if you must, but please just do not forget, this is where the real action is. And coming up next, we have a conversation between two Emmy award-winning writers and producers, Allison Venor and Peter Marietta, and they're going to be discussing streaming platforms and how to write and produce a hit television series, and generally what makes for good television which I think is something we're all interested in right now because we're all watching massive amounts of television right now. Or maybe I'm just speaking for myself. I'm watching a lot of television right now. In any event, with that, Allison and Peter, over to you. Hello. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Good. How are you? I'm good. It's been a crazy week. <laughs> How's it been? Yeah. <laughs> How about you? I don't know. They're all the same. Um, May was and June was crazy trying to finish scripts. So mm -hmm. that was where I felt the crunch of like weekends. And, you know, one of the things that coincided with the, the pandemic um, is this proliferation of um, platforms for people to write mm -hmm. and tell shows to. Um, and so not only are we figuring out new strategies and how we're going to work with each other online, but, you know, um, I can probably recite them. The ones that have come online since we went indoors, right? Mm -hmm. I've been HBO Max, mm -hmm. Peacock is about to come yep. online this week, mm -hmm. Quibi. Mm -hmm. um, those are three. Um, I think uh, Amazon and Netflix were already online yep. and CBS All Access was already online, but there's mm -hmm. all these um, different places to sell. Mm -hmm. um, how does that affect you developing projects? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny because I, I have been doing digital content and streaming content for over 10 years. Um, so back before really any of these platforms existed, I was, you know, producing and developing this type of content. And most of it was because, you know, when we had the technology to do it, it as storytellers, I was, you know, talking with a lot of people that had stories to tell that we're never going to, or at least at that point, we're never going to get them made on tr in traditional television, right? Mm -hmm. And even still, it's the same today, that we still have a struggle getting some of these stories um, in those traditional forms, uh, formats. And it's, it's fun and it's exciting to see the opportunities now coming across those more traditional, you know, the studios are looking at this stuff, um, the, you know, streaming platforms, it just content is king. So it's like, if you have a good story to tell and you're, you're able to kind of find that audience, even if it's like a small niche audience, um, you, can really, you can really tell any story at this point. Um, even, you know, long, long form versus short form, you know, my show after forever is short form, which, you know, there's not really a huge market for short form, but it was a way for us to get that story told and have those bigger conversations about making, you know, making something like this for a more traditional outlet. So, right. you know, some of these new technologies and these newer platforms are kind of the first, uh, kind of a window into, um, some of the more traditional spaces. So even podcasting, right? So I kind of like fell into podcasting just because I love telling stories and I'm obsessed with, uh, you know, true crime and wrongful, wrongful conviction stories. And, you know, and here I am now developing, you know, uh, 
scripted podcasts on as well as the non-scripted, just because, you know, if it's good story needs to be told, um, it doesn't matter real, really where, uh, where I can tell it. I, I just want to be able to get the, the information out there. So, right. mm -hmm. so uh, a couple of things you made me think of that, yeah. you know, one, do you, when I, when I started selling shows, it was 2003 and you would get an idea together. I'd get my pitch together and I would go around the, um, at that point there were six networks because the UPN and WB existed along with Fox. Mm -hmm. um, and while they each had their own brand and they each had their own brand of comedy, you did not necessarily tailor your pitch to the buyer. You're like, this is my show. And then you would find multiple buyers. Sure. You know, I was very lucky in that time, you know, like, oh, so-and-so wants it and so-and-so wants it. Um, but now with all of the platforms, you know, when you go in, it feels in some way to me, and I, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to be a little cynical for a second. It feels to me like some of these platforms announce what they're looking for and they have such a narrow viewpoint of it. They go, we are looking for this. We are looking yeah. for HBO Max is looking for female centric um, family and kids. That is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so you end up feeling like um, with your manager or agent, like, oh, well, I guess I came up with a show idea that we can take two places. Right. <laughs> um, and then on the, on the other side of it, you feel like, oh, shouldn't the people who are brand new, who don't really have a brand, HBO Max does not have a branded show. Right. Um, shouldn't they, like the old days when Fox first started, just be, be about like, well, we don't know yet. Let's take some chances. And I think when you look at something like Quibi, which is not doing well, mm -hmm. you could say, oh, did you guys get a little too cute yeah. about it? And now you're in trouble. Do yeah. you have a, does that resonate with you at all? In terms of the narrowness of what we have to do, the venues we can go pitch, in spite of all the platforms, it feels yeah. like after forever can only live in three places. Yeah, no, it's so true. I, I mean, I agree with that. And I think also just in, in recent conversations, that's usually what it is, right? It's like, well, we're, where are we taking the show? These are, these are the three places we're taking it. And then everything is completely tailored in that way. Um, so that's absolutely what's happening. Um, I think, you know, it's unfortunate because I feel like the mandates change also pretty quickly, right? It's like nobody wants a Western until a Western does well and now everybody wants a Western. So it's like, that's are we right. just going to continue chasing the thing that's doing well or do that's we right. just continue creating the stories that we think are amazing? Well, yes. And because I'm 54, right? I've lived through the <laughs> like, oh my God, how many, uh, how many times is a network going to try to do Mad Men? Right. Pan Am, et cetera, et cetera, right. Playboy Club. And you're like, wow, well, none of the things that made Mad Men, Mad Men can do anything on network resembling it. So it's no joke that those are all failures. And you're like, right. yeah, but I could have told them that, but nobody wanted to listen. <laughs> right. You know, like, oh, <laughs> hey guys. Um, and I say that about dramas because that's not really my bread and butter. So it's not like I was cynical because I on my show didn't get that. <laughs> no, but, but it's so true. And, and that's the thing that's, you know, it's like, it's frustrating on some level, but on another level, it's kind of like, you know, like right now, um, and over the past couple of years, like this, you know, push to have, you know, female stories and, sto you know, black stories and, you know, what have you. And it's like, well, there's a lot of us that have been telling those stories all along. Right. And so I, I'm grateful that at some point people are like, oh, maybe we should be, maybe we should get serious about those stories. You know, right. so I, I welcome that the mandate has changed and shifted, but yeah. it's also kind of sad that, you know, uh, that that exists, but that's the, the industry and the, and the hurdles that we, we have to work with. For sure. And when you speak about uh, stories that are centered around the female lens or the female point of view, and, you know, I guess my equivalent would be Latinx. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I too am hopeful, but I have to say a couple of things about it. And, and, and I, I invite you to comment as mm -hmm. close to the bone as you want, but I'll always leave with my chin and say that, you know, I feel like oftentimes what they say to me and what I hear like, oh, we're very compelled to do a lot next show. And then I will bring in a show I'm going to just make up one, um, but it was like a family drama that has a blended family and has a guy who's a coach and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the pitch, the question will be, um, what we, where's the culture in there? Right. And you're like, okay, okay. Now, 
and, and the, 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 the reluctance on my part is always because we've, we've kind of gone through this, what I call sort of um, culture porn already. We've got a bunch of Latin shows that are about saving the taco shop and gentrification. Mm. We've got, we had a bunch of movies about border crossing stories. Um, we, we've done that. And mm -hmm. that's not necessarily what the Latin audience in this country wants. Right. And I'm not going to pretend I know what they want, but I can tell you that a show like Mr. Iglesias is, you know, over indexing with the Latin X audience and causing people to make phone calls to ask how and why. And the question, the answer for us is always, Oh, because he's a, um, he's a teacher who's Mexican American, which means his dialogue and choices and scenes are going to be informed by that. But we're not, needing to show him eating a tortilla right. or doing anything like that it just comes out right and i've got to imagine there's a female equivalent of that absolutely i mean the only thing that the, the thing that's popping into my mind is actually not female a female example but it's more of an lgbt example because um, my show after forever is about gay men of a certain age having you know a life after loss and you know dating in their 50s and that, you know, because that's, you know, the most recent show that I'm, that I'm on, it's like, th you know, those, our show, while it's about gay men, it's not a gay show, right? It's like the, the, the themes are love and loss and moving on. And these are all universal ideas. It just happens to be that the main characters are in, in a, you know, two men in a relationship and a lot of yeah. their friends are, right? So, yeah. you know, it's, it's that weird, you know, place that you find yourself where it's like, you know, someone else's idea of what, you know, gay content is or what, you know, a, a female story is or a Latinx story is, you know, they're putting their own kind of biases and, and you know, ideas on top of that when that's not really the case. And we don't want to, we want to move beyond that, right? We don't want right. to be telling those like stereotypical right. stories anymore. We did that. It's not a coming out story. It's a story about like, this is a person's yes. life. They're human and this is how they're yes. living. I just pitched a show yesterday where um, I was told going in that um, it was very important that there be an LGBTQ element in the mm -hmm. show, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, but and it's so great you said that because here's what I said. I got to this point where we had three kids between 12 and 16. Mm -hmm. And instead of talking about which one was gonna be um, informed by the LGBTQ um, world, um, I said, okay, so-and-so's a, a, a mama's boy, this is who he is. So-and-so is a daddy's girl, this is who she is. So-and-so is a sort of rough and tumble dirty kid. You can't ever keep clothes on him for too long. He's just <laughs> a mess, you know, mm -hmm. clean clothes on him. Mm -hmm. And and then I said, look, I know this is super important to you guys, but I feel like in the modern world, what I'd rather do is introduce those three characters and then, you know, have that be the beginning of a journey that we go through where they're going to have as people who are creating their own identity, as mm -hmm. I have ch children at home who are creating their own identity in adolescence, that's going to become apparent to us as we move on. I'm not going to give you a roster of characters and go, that one is the gay one. Right. That is the trans person. I would rather have um, us explore and discover that mm -hmm. the person who we've been tracking that, you know, loves um, hip hop music and also uh, has a TikTok account mm -hmm. and can't stand what we're doing to the environment is also somebody who's struggling and, and, and telling the truth to their parents about something yeah. that they're keeping serious. And I, I don't know if it worked or not, because it was just yesterday, but I feel like that is so much more modern than mm -hmm. five years ago, which was like, oh, this is the gay one. Right, exactly. And this kind of leads me to my next question for you. But, you know, in, in, in what's going on right now in the world and kind of this, uh, you know, the, the pandemic and all of these kind of civil rights movements that have kind of all converged at this one time, you know, we're, we're, we're given the opportunity and kind of the permission to be talking about and saying more of these things openly, I think, and having these discussions. So like, what is the kind of climate right now? How is it affecting the way that you are telling stories and, and what, you're, what you're pursuing right now? Well, it's, it's a very similar uh, uh, comment you made earlier, which is, you know, I, you can look at my resume and from 2003 on, like putting, Latinx characters on television and Latinx writers and producers behind the camera has been the mission. And um, so I have victories and defeats along the way. Um, I think if I'm allowed to talk about it above ground uh, for a little bit, 
one of the things that is important is what I already said, which is don't assume that a Latin show mm -hmm. takes certain boxes. Listen to the creator who's talking to you because they have a voice and a message and that's important. Mm -hmm. I also think that um, it's time for us to say out loud two things. We need support with marketing. We are often sent out to die as shows with little or no help. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think people do it on purpose. I just think that it's hard to explain and it's hard to crack that market. And oftentimes when it's difficult, it ends up becoming a sort of pro forma, here's what we do. Sure. Um, and so we need that help. We need that help and we need that patience that um, happens. And then the last thing is, um, we also need to be allowed to fail. Like, I can't tell you how many showrunners and creators have a show that goes eight episodes and it's um, sort of a disaster for the audience and it's uh, creatively uh, a little confusing and we all have swings and misses. And the next day you read that, oh, so-and-so popped them up and grabbed them and they're doing this now. and. You know, I find that when you're a creator of shows and you're a person of color, the stakes seem so high and you seem to be on a tightrope all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure my colleagues would say that they are also on that tightrope. But if you really look at the statistics, I just feel like those people are given chance after chance after chance and we need to be allowed to do the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I mean, it's like we have to work that much harder to get to the same place and stay in the same place, but that shouldn't yeah. be the case. Um, no. And to get the same opportunities. Like we we can't we can't all succeed until everybody is given the same chance, but yeah. we we kind of, you know, it's it's good the momentum and the focus right now, I think is amazing um that we do have in the Black Lives Matter, you know, efforts because it's been a long time coming and there's a lot, obviously a lot of anger and a lot of um, things that need to be healed, like things that need yeah. to be healed and um, yeah. stories that need to be told. So, you know, we'll do the work and then we'll hopefully get to focus somewhere right. else and do the That's work right. and bring everybody together. <laughs> That's right. And I think that to me, you know, and it sounds like I'm plugging the show, but, but we're both talking about our contemporary experiences. Mm -hmm. But when you look at Mr. Iglesias second season now, which, which came out like three weeks ago, um, I really think anyone that looks at it will be astounded at um, a the amount of people of color that are just in our show, just walking and talking and doing stuff, and then also the way we would lightly touch on things that have really grown into the conversation. And we shot that show seven or eight months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so, with that in mind, let's just sort of take a second and speculate um, that if we can because we're in this thing now. And I feel like this thing may not go back to normal, but instead it will just become what it is, you know, different. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think 10 years from now, um, the entertainment landscape is gonna look like for a female mm -hmm. creative, a female producer, a female writer? Mm -hmm. Project that forward in, in your mind. What does that, what does that look like? Um, to me, I think, we're going to have a lot more power in the industry. Um, and most, mostly because of, I would say the black women that are already kind of doing it and paving the way, which is just, they're incredible. So it's like people like, you know, Ava and, you know, Shonda and all of these women that are just, you know, they're just plowing their way through finally and making a voice um, for women and, and showrunners and creators and, you know, producers, and, and then that should hopefully trickle down to all of the other departments um, on these shows and all of the other people that touch, you know, these, uh, these stories, you know. Um, I, I'm on the executive board of Women in Media, and that's one of our big efforts is gender parity, um, but, but really focusing on the below the line crew. Um, yeah. Because we feel that, and I feel strongly, and why I'm involved in it, because you know, there are so many stories that need to be told and no one's going to feel comfortable telling those stories until we're able to look around and be working with the people that look like us, right? Yeah. Or that, that looks like yeah. the world around us. And right. that's just the only, yeah, you know, one of the big ways we can make that possible, I think. Yeah, I, uh, I love that. And um, what I love about it is people who don't look like you and don't come from where you come from, make your shows better, period. Mm -hmm. I think um, we've been through 10 or 12 years of the feeling that 
by being present, we are being given a favor. Um, you know, I certainly was in a diversity program and felt that like, oh, we're giving this kid a chance. And mm -hmm. now I'm fully confident in the ground that I stand in mm -hmm. and on that we make your shows better when you include yep. us, period. Exactly. And that doesn't mean you hire me because you have a Latin character. That means right. you hire me because I'm going to make your show better. Exactly. You know, a perfect example. I don't remember if we talked about this last time we talked, but a perfect example of how we make your show better is this. In the last three weeks, we've read about a lot of people feeling badly and doing the right thing by saying, oh, I, I was part of a show that had four episodes in blackface and we pulled them, or okay. I was part yeah. of a show where a white actor voiced a black character for many years and now I see that that's wrong and we're done with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can say that, you know, I think I've probably logged between 250 and 300 episodes of TV and we've never taken a story like that to the stage or to the record booth. Like that's never happened. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that I've been there saying, hey guys, we shouldn't do it. It just means when you have a, a diverse group around you, there are people to tell you when you're about to do something like, hey, I know that you think that might be funny, but that might be a bad move. Yeah. And so it's no joke to me when I see all these mea culpas coming out that make me go, I wonder what the makeup of the group of people that were making decisions about this. Absolutely. Was. Absolutely. You're, you're completely right. So in a way it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's almost a, a form of protection. If you, if you have a diverse group around you, you're not going to miss steps yes, yes. and be just kind of like, you know, get, have all these yes men around you saying, oh yeah, you're hilarious. And you know, it's like this little bubble that's not seeing the reality of the situation. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Totally um, and so I, I think we're almost about done, but I have one mm -hmm. more question for you and it's, it's not on our pre-approved list, but I want to ask <laughs> you because you work in the short form. Yeah. Like, Tell everybody who's, you know, listening and working in the business or getting ready to work in the business, like, how do you, other than it's what your, your, your bulk of your work is in, how do you decide if something is a 15 minute show versus a 30 minute show versus mm -hmm. a 45 or an hour long show? Like what for you are some of the things that make you go, oh, this will work for me in this lane? Um, Specifically for After Forever, it was it was actually created to be kind of these shorter bite-sized vignettes um, that are all like very perfectly crafted and you know our um, our co-creators are just you know have been really amazing with with that. But the the idea was always to have these kind of smaller bite-sized pieces um, to tell this story. Um, the writer comes from television. Um, and has always written kind of in this episodic uh, situation. And for him, it was, it was an experiment. For me, I had been doing it for so long. Um, and for me, it was always about being able to tell these stories that weren't being greenlit and, you know, sold traditionally. It was like, all right, well then, you know, how do I turn this story into a, um, you know, into you know eight episodes that's about 90 minutes of content it's not a feature because it, it doesn't play that way it wasn't written and developed that way um and make that uh something that we can put out online right and so um you know and having success with other shows like that in the past um working with uh you know the creators of anyone but me and um other shows that have were short form and did very very well um and finding that that audience that's all in the LGBTQ community. Um, it was just a really perfect way to have that, have that like interaction with the audience. Right. So that, that's the other really exciting thing that we have now with technology and with doing short form and with releasing online is the instant reaction and feedback and that, you know, we're so much closer to our audience in a way we can have that conversation. I mean, even all the way to, you know, push the envelope to like what Twitch is doing. And a friend of mine oh, yeah. who I've worked with, Bernie Sue, who's a creator who always loves pushing the envelope in terms of, in terms of technology and figuring out how to, how to tell interactive stories. It's like, he's doing a show that's scripted and interactive. They're literally getting feedback and like building character on screen while they're, while the episode is going. Like right. it's craziness, you know, but yeah. it's like that stuff's, really fun 
and it's exciting. It's kind of, you know, it feels a little dangerous <laughs> to yeah, be yeah. doing things that yeah. way, but yeah. you have this like closeness to the audience that has never, never existed before. Right. Um, and that feedback and that instant, you know, discussion we're able to have with our audiences is just so precious. Cool. Now you can ask me one out of bounds question. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, the one thing that I, you know, that I was, we were, had talked about a little bit earlier or last time was about the pandemic and coming out of this. And I know you have a show where what you've done two seasons and then you have a, or you have another season coming up the same with, with after forever, we have a third season that's been already written, but now we're looking at, you know, the pandemic and the, and the way the world's going to be when we come out of this. And we were talking about how do we, you know, how do we deal with that? Are we going to deal with it? Are we going to, you know, create or, you know, recreate the world to fit in this space? Or are we going to ignore it? Like, what do we do? What does the yeah, story well, look, look like after this? Yeah. I mean, it is the biggest riddle of all. We've got six episodes in the can ready to go out for part two of season two, the way Netflix does it. Um, and with none of this has been accounted for. Mm -hmm. And so like, we're just gonna let it fly. It just is what it is. I know that we've talked about what would the first episode look like um, when we go back to work, if we go back to work, if they pick it up again. Um, because I do think we wanna deal with it. Now, because we're a comedy, you know, what we're thinking about is how can we, acknowledge it and move on mm -hmm. and then let the time that was spent that we're going to assume was off screen inform our present stories. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at like, I'm texting back and forth with Kevin Hench, who's the show creator and my partner in running the show. And, you know, we're just pitching jokes right now. Just like, mm -hmm. you know, somebody coming in class going, well, that was weird, right? <laughs> and another right. joke and then you're like all right let's get into the civil war and um so i i feel like you know and then the punchline on that is you know one of our characters go which civil war the original one i, the, I was yeah. i was just gonna you know, say <laughs> right so like yeah. we're looking at like how do we how do we acknowledge it to our fans to the people that love mm -hmm. our show and view it and then say you're in our hands and we got you we're not going to ignore it but we're also going to give it the Mr. Glacius treatment, which is we're right. going to have fun with it. We're going to discuss it. And we're going to also talk about what it is to be a human being and trying to find your way. Well, I'm <laughs> off to get COVID tested. What are you going to do? Oh, well, that sounds oh, like yeah. a good idea. <laughs> well, I I'm staying put for sure because I'm flying next week. So I'm, I've okay. not gone anywhere. So okay. I'm just in my house working as well, usual. Be safe. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Be safe and, you too. Uh, wish me luck. Yes, good second, luck. My second test of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not crazy about them, but I also feel like it's good it to regularly. Hurt. Yeah. I was actually I'm actually looking to try to get one before I leave next Thursday. And then yeah. when I get to where I'm going, I'm gonna be getting a couple. So that's right. You know, we, that's what Dodger we have to Stadium. do. I went to Dodger Stadium last time. It's also fun when you and I never go anywhere right. to, pick, to pick the location because you're like, oh, like I'm going down to the Westlands <laughs> district to get my test because I'm like, oh, I haven't been there in a while. That'll be right. a nice drive. Like, oh, I haven't seen, like, what, what's going on in, the, in that part of the city to, you know, these days? That's right. I know. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you for the conversation. Yeah, thank you, right. too. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person at some point. Yes, we will make that happen. All right, uh -huh. have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.